Welcome to Haver Assembly Online. I'm Pastor Jamie. We're so excited for today. We're talking about one of the best people in all of the Bible. His name is David. Pastor Kurt's going to talk all about him. One of the most in interesting phrases that you hear used about David is that he's a man after God's own heart. What does that mean? It means that his heart and God's heart are very similar. The reason they're similar is because David loved God and God loved David and David spent time with God and God spent time with David. One of the worship songs we're singing today is a song called In the Garden. My mom grew up singing that song in a little country church every Sunday. She knows it well. It's her favorite. If it's the only song you knew, it'd be your favorite too. But the chorus of that song says, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy that we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. What does that mean? It means that your heart and God's heart are aligned. Do you want a heart after God this morning? Let's worship him with everything that we have. Enjoy the service. I'm Dana Stahl. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for being with us, and we pray that you would be glorified with our worship and yes, that Lord. we would seek a deeper re relationship with you and that through that relationship we would have victory and freedom. Amen. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide it was my tomb till I met you you called my name and I ran out of that grave Oh 
I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their sea and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we take I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling But he bids me go Through the voice of woe His voice to me is calling And he walks with me And he talks with me the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known oh, we worship you Lord Great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his. Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, 
the one who set us free. Lord, you make it so that we are free to walk with you so we can have joy as we tarry with you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Lord, help us to be men and women after your own heart. Help our hearts to match your heart by spending so much time with you that we look more and more like our Savior. Lord, we thank you for the hope that you have, the hope that we have in you. Yes, Lord. The hope that you give. Yes, Jesus. And Lord, all that you do. Yes, God. Lord, as we continue in worship, as we hear your word this morning, I pray that your name will be glorified. Yes, God. Help us to become more and more like you. In your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, are you ready to get into the word? I sure am. You know, in today's culture, and in every culture that there's ever been, there have always been superstars or, or people, personalities that we really look forward to. They're big personalities. And one of those people we're going to talk about today, his name is David. And the title of today's message is, From Shepherd to King. 
A lot, of, a lot of ground to cover today with this David character. So let's get right into it. Saul, the first king of Israel, has basically been dismissed by God. Samuel the prophet has let him know, hey, your reign is over. I have to now look for your successor. And God tells Samuel, hey, I need you to go to Bethlehem, and I need you to visit a man by the name of Jesse, because I've called one of his sons to be the next king, and you're going to go anoint him. And so Samuel goes, meets up with Jesse, finds out that Jesse has a lot of sons. And so Jesse presents each one of these men before the prophet Samuel. First one comes up, Eliab, and Samuel looks at him and says, oh boy, this, this, this looks like it. This, this has got to be the next king. God says, no. And in fact, God tells Samuel something very important. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, God says, the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I don't know about you, but for me, that's very good news on a lot of different levels. It's good news because so often we feel like we, we fail in the outward appearance area when that isn't really what God's looking at at all. He's looking at our hearts. But then, you know, there's other times when we're really trying to make the outside look good, but like Jesus said of the Pharisees in the New Testament, you look great on the inside, but your insides is like dead men's bones. Well, no matter what you and I are looking like on the inside, that's where God is looking, and that's what he's paying attention to. And that's what God was looking at as these sons of Jesse were presented to Samuel the prophet. The second one comes, Abinadab. God says, no. Third one comes, Shama. No. Four more sons. No. All the sons that are there. No. Samuel says, wait a minute. I know I'm supposed to anoint one of your sons, the next king. You, are you sure you don't have any more sons? That's a weird question to ask a dad. You lose one somewhere. So, so somebody's been misplaced. You left one at Walmart. What happened? And Jesse says, no, wait, there is one more, the youngest, but he's out tending the sheep. Samuel says, well, you go out and get him because I'm not sitting down to eat until we've seen him and I see what the Lord tells me. So they bring the youngest one in, David, and immediately Samuel looks at him and God says, yep, this is the one. And I'm sure Samuel's looking at him compared to all the other brothers and thinking, he's, he's, he's young. He's young. Lord. And God says, he's the one. So Samuel anoints him the next king right then and there. Well, as we move forward in young David's life, the next story is like one of the most popular stories in the Bible because it's when the Israelites were fighting the Philistines and David's three older brothers, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah were in the army. David's father, Jesse, says, hey, I'm gonna send you with some food out to your brothers, see how everybody's doing and bring me word. And so David takes the food and he goes and sure enough, he gets to the battle, but he finds out nothing's really going on. And why is it? Because the Philistines have a champion by the name of Goliath. And Goliath of Gath is a giant nine feet tall, probably between 350 to 500 pounds. Huge, huge bulk of a man. And he's come down every day for 40 days, issuing a challenge to the Israelites saying, send somebody to fight for me. If he beats me, we're your slaves. If I beat him, you're our slaves. And nobody in the Israelite camp is going to respond. And you know who would be probably the most likely candidate? King Saul. Remember, he's head and shoulders taller than everyone else. But he's not going out there. Everybody's afraid. Well, David is looking at this and uh, he says, why hasn't anybody gone out to fight him? I don't get it. He's challenging the armies of the living God. Give me a break, guys. And uh, people are like, 
what's this young guy saying? His brothers get upset at him. Others are wondering about him. He says, wait, um, I'll fight him. Hey, whoever's in control here, uh, let him know I'll fight him. Got no problem with that. So they bring him word. They bring him to Saul and Saul and David start talking. And David says, I'll do this. No problem. I can't believe this guy has been allowed to do this for 40 days. Well, we go to 1 Samuel 17, 33, and here we pick up the conversation. Saul says to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. But David, verse 34, said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Verses 36 and 37. I've done this to both lions and bears. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. What? What basis was David using? Hey, I may look small, and I may look young, but I'm telling you, I know how to take care of sheep. And God helps me when I need his help to defeat things like lions and bears. Oh my. This Philistine is going to be just like a tiger. I'll tear him apart too. Well, Saul says, all right, but he has his own ideas about what to do. We pick it up with verse 38, same chapter. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. What's happening here? Saul is, is trying to outfit David. He's trying to give him uh, tools to use, but they're not suited to David. David's never used these tools. They're great tools, great armor, great weaponry. David just doesn't know how to use them. And so when David goes out to fight Goliath, he says, I'm going to take my shepherd's staff my sling, and some stones. That's what I'm used to. That's what I know to fight with. And so here we go to the battlefield. Many of you know this story. They get out there and Goliath is absolutely insulted that they've sent a little whelp like this young man, David, to fight him. And he basically tells David, hey, I'm, I'm going to literally tear you apart and let the birds feast on your carcass. Now, remember, this is a nine foot, 300 to 500 pound man with armor on and weapons saying this. You know how David responds? You go to verse 45. I'll paraphrase it for you. He basically says, you, Goliath, come to me with a sword and a spear and javelin. But I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, who you have defied. You have defied God, Goliath, and you're going to pay. And I'm here to make sure it happens. We pick it up with verses 46 and 47. This is little David talking. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. What is David saying? Hey, Goliath, you're only seeing a little guy down here with a staff and a sling and a stone. You are totally missing the big picture of who is with me. 
Our God is with me. And you have no clue how much trouble you are in right now. And he lets him know. You see, David has a tremendous faith in God. Well, you know the story. Goliath comes out. David runs onto the battlefield, takes a rock, puts it, takes a stone, puts it in his sling, winds up, and bam. As far as we know, first stone out of the chute, boom, hits Goliath square in the middle of the forehead, knocks him down dead. David runs up to him, takes his sword, cuts off his head, holds his head up. Instant chaos in Bedlam. The Philistines are running away. The Israelites are coming and enjoying the spoils of victory. It's a crazy, wonderful, victorious day for Israel. And as a result, David is welcomed into Saul's family. In fact, he becomes very, very best friends with Saul's, one of Saul's sons, Jonathan. Says they were like brothers, best friends. Later on, uh, one of his daughters, Michael, one of Saul's daughters, Michael, falls in love with David. He ends up marrying her. So he is literally part of the family. Everyone likes him. He's becoming very popular. He, the Bible says that David behaved wisely and was accepted in the sight of all the people. In other words, David was a wise man and he was becoming very popular. Well, the straw that broke the camel's back was when after this victory took place, there were some ladies that were singing a song. And the words to the song were, Saul has slain his thousands, and David has slain his ten thousands. And when King Saul heard that, he became very angry and extremely jealous. And from that day on, he was out to get David. Now, a couple of points here before we move on the story. First of all, Remember again the tools that David used. A sling, a stone, a staff. Why did he use them? Because those are the things that he knew how to use. Now you find when he slew Goliath, he kept Goliath's sword and his armor, stashed it away. Guess what? He learned how to use that stuff. He became a warrior that knew how to use armor and sword and shield and spear and all of that. And the point is this. You and I are to use what's in our hands right now. The tools that are at our disposal right now, we are to use those. Because that's what we're used to. But you know what? It's not a bad idea for us to use other tools that we haven't mastered yet. I think a great example of that is what we've learned to do with our online church and, and videotaping, pre-recording, and, and all those type of things. This, so much of this has been very new to us. But little by little, we're beginning to learn how to use our sword, our shield, our spear, the, the tools that God is giving to us. It, it also works in the realm of people. You know, on our pastoral staff, everybody has certain gifts and talents. And it's so important as the leader of this group that I allow each pastor to really find their sweet spot of where they minister best and then just let them do it. And then don't get jealous or angry when they succeed. And so many times I think in ministry and in life, we, we have a tendency when someone on our team or whatnot succeeds to get jealous of them or even angry with them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that ought not to be. God wants us to rejoice with them and to, to help them to be their best, to do their best. That's what we want to do. I love the team that I get to be on because everyone's finding their sweet spot and we're just letting each other do the best we can with the tools that God has given us and the tools that we're learning to use. Well, as we keep going with this story, now David is on the hot seat. King Saul He's got a problem with him. In fact, 
while David is playing the harp because he was a musician and a poet and he would play the harp to soothe Saul when an evil spirit would trouble him. Twice, King Saul tries to nail him with a spear to the wall. So it's very evident that David is in danger. So Saul ends up putting David in charge of a thousand guys and getting him out of there. And everywhere he goes, David is successful. So now... Saul begins to hunt David because now he wants to kill him. He's so angry and so jealous and can't stand the fact that David is doing well and that he's popular, although David has never done anything or said anything to harm him, that Saul is out to kill him. Well, how does David respond? So glad that you asked. We turn to Psalm 59 and we read some verses, 1 through 5, 9 and 10, 16 and 17. Here's how David responded to being hunted by Saul and his men. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloodthirsty men. For look, they lie in wait for my life. The mighty gather against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves through no fault of mine. Awake to help me, and behold, you therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Do not be merciful to any wicked transgressors. I will wait for you, O you my strength, for God is my defense. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire on my enemies." but I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning, for you have been my defense and refuge in the day of trouble. To you, O oh my strength, I will sing praises, for God is my defense, my God of mercy. What do you hear David doing here? He's crying out to the Lord for God's help not taking things into his own hands. He's crying out to God. Well, as he's being hunted, there's one particular story kind of interesting. And what happens is David and his men are hiding in a big cave, way in the back of the cave. And Saul and his men are looking for them. Well, come to find out, just like all of us anywhere, anytime, uh, all of us need to use the restroom sometimes. And when you're out searching for people in caves, where do you go to the restroom? Saul decided, I'm going to go to the restroom in the cave. So he goes in to the cave to relieve himself. And da remember, David and his men are way back in the cave, but they know who's coming in. They know what's going on. David's men whisper to him, hey, this is our chance. This is your chance to take him out. Let's kill him now. Well, David goes up and the, I don't know how he'd succeeded at this. He must have been cunning and crafty and sneaky and just a really stealthy soldier. But he cut off a piece of Saul's garment. And even while he's doing it, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit convicts him and says, you ought not to do that. So he backs out of that. He goes back to his guys and says, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to harm him. I'm not going to touch him. He's the Lord's anointed, and this is God's deal. I, I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. So he backs up. Saul finishes his business, heads out of the cave. He's no sooner out the cave and down a ways, and David comes out of the cave and greets him and says, Hello, how you doing, King Saul? And Saul whips her, What? It's David. Hey, let's, let's get him. And, and David says, well, hold on, everyone. I want you to know something, King Saul. You were just in this cave. Me and my men are in this cave. You see this thing I have in my hand? Yes, it's the corner of your robe. I came and cut it off while you were relieving yourself. I could have killed you at any moment. I could have killed you. But Saul, you are the Lord's anointed, and I have never, ever 
said a bad word about you and I have never ever done something to destroy you or come against you. I don't really understand why you're chasing me. I don't really understand why you're trying to kill me, but I've done nothing to harm you and I've not sinned against you. Well, Saul admits that David has spared his life and he admits in this instance that David is right. So they make a treaty of sorts. It's not really much of a treaty, though, because basically it's a treaty where they each said, I won't kill you if you don't kill me. Wow. And to think that they used to be family. Well, David responds to this happening, and it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 7 and 47. David sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent men you save me. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and have been saved from my enemies. The waves of death swarmed about me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called out to my God. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. And verse 47 The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. I love those scriptures because you find the source of David's strength. It was in this relationship with God that he cultivated, that he had, that he treasured, and he knew to cry out to God and fully expected that God would come through And he saw that God always did. Well, I wish I could tell you that Saul didn't hunt him anymore, but he did. So David and his men eventually had to move to Philistine territory just to stay out of Saul's way. And the Philistines kept fighting with the Israelites and kept fighting with Saul. And in one of these battles, a telltale battle, three of King Saul's sons were killed including David's best friend, Jonathan. Later on in the battle, um, King Saul is wounded by an archer. Wounded pretty severely. He knows he's not going to make it. He, uh, he tells his armor bearer to kill him. His armor bearer won't do it. So the Bible tells us that Saul fell on his old sword and killed himself. It's a terrible and tragic end to Saul's life, Jonathan's life, and his other two sons. And you know what? David grieved for all of them because he had been in their family. Jonathan was his best friend. And even though he and his father-in-law, King Saul, were estranged, he still grieved for them. Well, the Israelites had to move on. And so David's tribe, Judah, they accepted him as king right away. But there was a seven-year struggle as the rest of Israel was accepting David as king because there was an ongoing fight between David and his group and Ishbosheth, which was one of Saul's sons that lived, and that went on for seven years. Finally, David led two major victories over the Philistines and was accepted as the king of all of Israel. Now, one of the things that, that he did that you don't hear too much about But it's pretty major, and that is that he moved the capital of Israel from Hebron, where he had been at the beginning, to Jerusalem after they beat the Jebusites that were there. And to this day, Jerusalem is so vitally important to the life, to the history, to the people of Israel, and not only to the people of the Israel, but to the people like you and me, the people of God. Our eyes are always looking to Jerusalem. Our eyes are always looking to Israel. Well, you know, David loved God so much. He loved God deeply. 
And brothers and sisters, we could learn a lesson from him in all of the psalms that he wrote and uh, the music that he wrote. You find this man who was a warrior and who was becoming a king, but who had been a shepherd before. There's just such life and vitality in the words that he writes. So much of it is in scripture, in the book of Psalms and other places. But he loved God deeply. And he wanted his nation to love God as well. And he thought, you know, it would be a great idea to move the ark of God, which had come back from Philistine territory 20 years before and had been on the border, to move it to this new capital in Jerusalem. Now they ran into some snags along the way. And I don't need to go there, but you can read it. But finally, it's happening. And the ark is coming into Jerusalem. And David is so excited about the ark of God, the presence of God being established in Jerusalem, in the capital, that the Bible says he danced before the Lord with all of his might. Now, apparently it must have been quite a spectacle because his wife, Michael, Saul's daughter, didn't like what she saw and made fun of him. And the Bible says she despised him in her heart. And here's how David responds, 2 Samuel 6, 21 and 22. So David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord, and I will be even more undignified than this, and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of whom you've spoken, by them I will be held in honor. What was David saying? David was telling her, hey, you're making fun of me, and you're despising me, Michael. But you have to understand that even though you're my wife and I value my relationship with you, my relationship with God is way, way infinitely more important than my relationship with you. And so I'm not really paying attention to your words because what I did, I did for God and for no one else. And it's good for me to be humbled before God. And I will do that and I will even do more. I will become undignified. It, it wasn't that he was putting on a show. It, it wasn't that he was trying to be weird. It was that he radically loved God and this was a demonstration of his love for God. Brothers and sisters, don't always expect other people to understand why you do the things you do or why you say the things you say when you are loving your God and serving your God. Not everybody's gonna understand. It's not gonna make sense to everyone. But you know what? Keep doing it. Keep loving the Lord. Keep serving the Lord. And if God tells you to dance before the Lord, you dance before the Lord. Whatever the Lord lays in front of you, you do it. And will you face some flack along the way? David did. So I'm sure you and I will too. Well, this man David, he moved from being a shepherd to being an outcast of a family, hunted man, to being a king. And he began thinking about building a permanent temple for God's presence. But the prophet Nathan told him, no, no, it's not yours to do. He told him that the Lord promised David that he would establish David's kingdom forever and that David's son would build the temple. What did David do? He organized an effective army that stabilized Israel's borders and eliminated regional oppression. David was a warrior, a poet. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. Remember way back to when Samuel was looking and God said, don't look at the outward appearance. I'm looking at the man's heart. And God saw that even though David was not a perfect man, he had a heart after God. He was a man after God's own heart. 
What kind of a person are you and I today? Are we people that sincerely desire to have a heart like God's heart? David did, and God knew it. And God also knows that about us. David was a leader who put God first, who loved and followed God with all his heart. Is that how you and I are? We certainly can be. This, this, this relationship with God was not limited to David only. This relationship with God was available to all, is available to all. David wanted the rest of his kingdom to know that. That's why he wrote those songs. That's why he led the way that he did was to show them any one of us can have this with the Lord. But do you want it? You got to want it. Do you want it? I want that kind of relationship with the Lord. And we find that God blessed this shepherd king in everything that he did. From shepherd to king. God saw his heart. He honored his heart. He honored his obedience. And he blessed him. But I'm here to tell you in closing, there were trials. (laughs) But we're not going to talk about those today. That's for a little bit later. So let's quickly review. What have we learned in the last few moments? First of all, God looks on the heart. Not what we put out here, what's in here. Secondly, when we go to fight a battle, we do not go in our own strength. And we are facing adversaries that look huge to us, but in God's eyes, they're little. We need to remember that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And fight our giants just like David did, with the power of God and with the awareness of the strength of God. Thirdly, we need to remember to use the tools that right now we know how to use and let God win battles through our hands with the tools we have now, but also be willing to learn to use the new tools that God makes available. And then lastly, four, never be ashamed of your service, devotion, and love to God. No matter what it leads you to do or to say, it's okay. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And brothers and sisters, sometimes that's not going to meet with everyone else's approval. Well, maybe you're out there today and you really don't have a close relationship with the Lord like you see that this shepherd boy, outcast and soon king, had. You can have that, but it starts by being born again. It starts by coming to God and trusting Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for your sin. It starts there. That's just the beginning of your journey, your lifelong journey with Christ. But if you're out there, why not pray today and accept Jesus' sacrifice and start this journey? You could pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I understand that I am a sinner, that I have done wrong, that I've thought wrong, that I've acted wrong, that I've said wrong. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, the ones in the past, the ones right now, and even the ones in the future. I accept your sacrifice on the cross for me and for my salvation. And God, I want to start my lifelong journey with you. I want to start it right now. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Lead me and guide me and help me. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm here to tell you, if you just prayed that prayer with me, you're starting a new journey. And already you can sense the stirring of God's Holy Spirit inside your heart. But for those of you that are watching today, 
and you've known the Lord for a while, some for three years, some for 10, some for 30, some maybe only this past year, no matter where you're at in your lifelong journey with Christ, there's more for you and there's more for me. There was more for David and he was after the more. And I have to ask you, are you praying for, are you longing for more of God, more of his spirit, more of his work in your life? Let's end today, this service today, by crying out to God for more of his spirit, more of his word, more of his strength. Would you join me in that prayer? Dear Father, thank you for this man, David, that you worked so incredibly in. Thank you for his heart that was after you, God. I pray with my brothers and sisters today, Lord, as we're having church together online, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, even now, would saturate every single home, every single place, Lord, where this is being watched. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit would settle in and just begin to draw us closer to you. Lord, we want more of you. We want more of your Holy Spirit, more devotion to you, more service to you, a closer walk with you. Lord, we cry out for that. We pray that we would be like David and be men and women with hearts after you. Holy Spirit, we give you permission today to help us in this endeavor. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you is my prayer. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, this is what's coming soon at Haver Assembly. So many of us were, were frustrated and sad by the fact we can't have family camp at Hungry Horse this year. But I've got great news. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, July 5th, 6th, 7th, we're bringing family camp to our church. Sunday morning will feature our superintendent, Dave Phillips, preaching and the ordination service of our own Pastor Jamie, one of eight that are being ordained in that service. Then Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, Pastor Kevin Gear from the Canvas Church will be preaching. So what we can do is I'm inviting you to our playground here. Come camp out here for family camp in the yard, bring RVs, whatever, bring food. We'll hang out. We'll have a great time. And then in the evenings and Sunday morning, we'll enjoy services and worship together. Also, Pastor Jamie would want me to remind you that uh, high school camp, middle school camp, kids camp, they're all happening and you need to sign up your kids. You can come to our website to figure that all out. And we need adults to volunteer. So keep us informed about that. That's all for this week. Stop, collaborate, and listen.